Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential series debates. This is a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Today, I got a good lineup for you. We are joined by Kim Ruff, Daniel Berman, Christopher Marks, Ben Letter, Arvin Vora, all running for president, all libertarians, and we're going to be discussing foreign policy. Candidates, you know the rules. You got two minutes to answer these questions. At the end of your allotted time, I'll simply say time and just quickly wrap up your thought. You can also finish and yield the remainder of your time. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I have designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly formats you may be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges I propose, how well you understand the question that I set before you, and how well you manage your time, and how compelling your answers are to make all Americans and not just libertarians vote for you. At the end, you'll be given three minutes to issue a closing statement. I will allow some time in between for us to have an open forum a little bit, and I will use some questions that have been submitted online to it, our, our Facebook Live to us. So if you got a question for the candidates, hit us up, let us know. And... Uh, yeah, at the three-minute summary, you can summarize your feelings on foreign policy, challenge an opponent's response to the question, anything that you think didn't get brought up to during the debates, that would be the right time to bring that up. But candidates, here we go. According to the party platform, there is only one exception in which the Libertarian Party allows for government involvement, and that is in matters pertaining to defense. On top of that, congressional law requires minimums for both staffing and finance when it comes to the areas of defense. With that being stated, what is your plan for complying with these agreements, and would you use your influence to change either one? We will start with Ms. Kim Ruff. Oh, thank you. So just to reiterate, you're saying that our party platform says that the only time it's acceptable to use government intervention is for defense, that there are congressional limits on how much you can spend on staffing and other matters. That's correct. And that's set by Congress. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I don't actually agree that the only time is acceptable to use government is for defense. I actually don't think it's ever necessarily acceptable to use government, period, because government in and of itself is a monopoly on force. And anytime you do use government, it is through initiation of force or fraud. If a nation of people want to voluntarily come together to defend its interests, then that is their prerogative and their right but it is not for government to compel action. So I don't agree with that. As such, I would petition Congress from a position as president to eliminate those limits. We don't necessarily have to have a standing army. I know that it is in terms in the constitution about how it's the responsibility of Congress to maintain a standing army, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I can petition Congress to try and change that and ask them to put forward a constitutional amendment to eliminate that clause. That's what I would do with respect to that. Fantastic. We'll move on to Ben Letter. Well, this is why the, the platform in and of itself is, is, is not uh, good enough. Um, because the, the Department of Defense, they call themselves the Department of Defense. So what is defense? And it's, it's a really ambiguous term. Where do, you, where do you draw the line? When do you put the fire out? Do you put the fire out when it's in the kitchen or do you wait till the, the house is burned down and then, then come put the fire out? Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to apply the, the party platform as it is now to, to every, every situation that has to do with the, the subject of defense without creating a, uh, an argument over principles. Um, I think that, generally speaking, uh, aside from you know your uh, your, your lone madman out there, that uh, everybody feels the same way that force, whether it's being used by a government or any group for that matter, uh, should be reserved uh, in you know instances that involve the defense of uh, life, uh, liberty, uh, property, uh, and you know otherwise necessities to live. Um, you know, that, that being said, um, I think that, uh, 
we've taken um, uh, a step too far in a lot of directions as far as <clears throat> how we interpret defense as, as a nation. And uh, we're really operating on a on an outdated method uh, that involves bases all over the world and people all, all over the world. And we see that in this modern cyber era that, you know, people from other countries are able to do things like manipulate our elections and and create chaos here in America without having to have bases here and without having to have troops here. And I think that we need to really rethink what defense is in the 21st century. Time. Uh, Arvin, Vora, you are up next. A couple things. The first thing I want to bring up is that the Libertarian Party platform does not require that the government use force for defense. It simply gives that option. And that is an option that I think is perfectly valid. I think it's perfectly valid to have that option open. However, what we have right now is not the government using the military for defense. What we have is a combination of welfare job creation, uh, this massive standing army that we don't need for anything pertaining to our own defense. We have military welfare, where we're essentially providing free military to every country on Earth. All that's doing functionally is enabling European socialism by providing their defense so they can spend their money on social welfare and encouraging our supposed allies into taking more and more risky behaviors because they know that we have their back. I don't believe that that's an appropriate use for a government. I don't think it's even appropriate use for somebody to do voluntarily. I think it's morally wrong what's going on. So when, when it comes to acting as president, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut down four military bases, bring the troops home. I'm going to cut spending massively. I'm going to fire most current military staff and let them find less morally questionable jobs. When it comes to the specific congressional requirements, obviously I'm going to work to change them. I'll work to change them nicely if I can. If I need to use some kind of made up Trump style tactics, I'll do that if I need to. But the simple fact is that these requirements are reflective of our current culture. And if we want to change those requirements, if we want to change this government, we need to change culture. If I'm elected president, it means the culture has changed massively. We've gotten rid of the ideas of welfareism and excessive militarism. And I'm going to do whatever I need to to reduce those requirements, shut down foreign military bases, bring the troops home, and stop using the military as a world's welfareist police. All right, let's move it along to Daniel Berman. So I, I think there's a lot of um, interesting points to this question. Um, and, you know, really it comes down to what is what is a legitimate use of government force in defense. And if you look at this, you know, I, I like to kind of abstract things into like, OK, you know, we're emotionally attached to we've got this big piece of of land that we all live on and we all want to defend it. We all want to be feel safe, uh, you know, whatever way it is, we all want to feel safe in our own homes. Um, what is the valid use of force? And most of us agree that in self-defense is always a valid use. Now, when you have something with foreign policy that gets really complicated with are people plotting to hurt you in the future? Um, and is there something you can do to stop it by doing all these other things that we consider immoral, like invading other countries and taking down their dictators? Then that's kind of where people start getting, you know, well, okay, maybe we should, you know, it's, it's for our own safety. We should break some of these rules and, and initiate the force. Um, I don't believe that's, that's really necessary. And I think we should, uh, you know, first of all, lead by example. One thing we really need to consider is when countries go to war with each other, sometimes it's, it's one crazy guy, but it's always like, oh yeah, the Chinese want to go to war with, with Russia or Russia wants to go to, or, or Iran, <laughs> you know, they throw out the names of these big uh, geographic areas, but the reality is most of the people in those areas want nothing to do with us. It's not, it's not an entire country that wants to go to war with us. It is a lone madman or, uh, or a government that they have control over. So we need to look at things like that and we need to only act defensively, but we shouldn't have necessarily a standing army. The constitution even, even says, you know, Hey, we should have, uh, militias, which are basically volunteer organizations where people would, would train to defend their own land and their own territories as needed, not something where we needed to have military bases all over the world. So we definitely need to scale back on that. We need to get rid of all this, this wasteful stuff that we're doing. Um, we need to get rid of, we need to stop invading other countries and only act defensively. And we need to figure out what, what the line is on that legitimate use of actual defense. 
Sure. So let's go ahead and get our closing remarks on this question from Christopher Marks. You know, in uh, my extensive reading, I think I, I, I stumbled across a document by, I believe it was a general of China or Japan, I think it was maybe Japan, that said that it would be, never be a feasible concept to take a land, a, a land fight to America, because behind every bush, there was a man with a gun. Um, that is one of the important aspects of our Second Amendment constitutional right, um, as well as defending ourselves against a government that's gone awry. We have not had any military action in the last 30 years or more that involved us being in a defensive posture. It was always in an aggressive posture to control how a foreign government actually chose to exchange a GDP product of petroleum that they produced in their nation. We have military bases all across this world. We are causing post-traumatic stress disorder to our military personnel, and we are, and we are, and we are failing them as servants to our nation through the VA. And it's all not for any moral and ethical position whatsoever. So a Marx 2020 administration would close down all of those military bases and bring them back to the United States. I think that we need to see our military personnel who have been sworn to uphold and defend our constitution actually in a position of policing power and let our police officers then seek honest, honest employment and possibly pick up the constitution and do some reading there. We can more uh, we can modify our nation and bring it back to the roots of what our nation was for. And it was not and never has been to control the whole entire of the world entirety of the world. It has been meant to make sure that these American people are safe and protected. Great. Let's move on to the next question. As commander in chief, you will have an executive responsibility to lead our men and women in the armed forces. First, give me any qualifications you might have in leadership roles as it pertains to combat. And second, give the audience a brief overview of your plan for the military as a commander in chief. We're going to start this one off with Arvind Vora. As a person that runs an international business, I have students from all over the world. I know that if we want to spread American culture, we need to do it with free market trade, not war. When we work, when we engage in business with other countries, with people from other countries, what happens is our culture, our culture of freedom, democracy, free, uh, equal rights, liberalism, those ideas spread. And that's the way to wage a modern war. To try to engage in a culture war using military force is baboon level stupid. The use of old fashioned military techniques in a modern marketplace simply does not make sense. And so if you wanna ask my experience, my experience is this, I know that if we wanna share ideas, if we wanna convince people to join us, force is not the way to do it, commerce is the way to do it. My plan for the military is simple. We don't need to use force to spread American ideas. And the way that we do that is by shutting down all foreign military bases, bring the troops home, ceasing to date deal with other nations with threats and violence, ending all trade sanctions so that other countries, including countries like North Korea, can see the wonders of capitalism, so they can see why they should adopt our ideology, so that their businesses have to learn about our culture so they can sell us things. That's what I wanna see happen. My plan for the military is this. We need a much, 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 much smaller military if we need any military at all. I want a military that is the smallest and the cheapest, the lowest costing just to protect America. Not France, not Israel, not Saudi Arabia, just the United States and let other countries provide their own defense. Welfare, I believe, domestically is wrong, but foreign military welfare is both wrong and inexplicable. If elected, I will end world policing. I will shut down all that behavior and I will cut your taxes accordingly. Great. Next up, let's have Kim Rep's thoughts on this. 
Would you kindly repeat the second half of your question? The first part you asked about leadership skills, but the second one you asked what it would look like? Uh, the leadership skills, uh, yes, any leadership role, uh, give me any qualifications you might have in leadership roles as it pertains to combat. And then also give the audience a brief overview of your plan for the military as a leader. Okay. All right. So as far as leadership roles and responsibilities are concerned, I would say that above and beyond all, they would need to have good character. So they'd have to have integrity, honesty, a commitment to ethics. I think that's incredibly important in a leadership role. Additionally, I think that they would have to be excellent communicators and have a respect for other cultures and individuals, as well as a desire to preserve human life above all else. I think that would be hugely important and that would make them more likely to make healthier, humanistic, and safer decisions. Coolness under pressure is always a big one. Your ability to remain calm and deal with problems as they come with you without making rash decisions, costly decisions, is hugely important in a leader. And insofar as how the military would work under me, largely I would relegate it to a reservist status. My goal would be to end up ending all foreign wars of aggression, close all military bases, bring our troops back home, cease foreign aid, both military and material, and then um, basically engage in diplomacy and conflict negotiation through communication. So our military really would not be very active. In fact, they'd probably have to find other jobs to offset their income. That would be ideal. Okay, Christopher Marks, you're up next. Well, leadership skills. Uh, used to be in business management. That was uh, my original um, profession. I was kind of bored with it. So I went into troubleshooting and tech support. I enjoyed that. Um, as far as military understanding, it's a, it is mandatory reading for any general in the U.S. military to read The Art of War. And I have been reading The Art of War numerous times a year since the age of 14, and I'm now 42. Um, and combat. I think that the best way of actually dealing with any combative situation as somebody that considers themselves a self-professed hacker, um, I say that you use intellect, you use words. One of the best military practices that I saw the United States get involved with was in 2013, 2014, during the East, Eastern Bloc of Ukraine um, and the information war that the United States established and created to overthrow the pro-Russian uh, leadership of the Ukrainian government. I don't agree with what they did there in involving themselves in foreign government policy. However, it was an it was an inspirational use of an information war practice. Those are the things that I would do. We don't need to use force. We can spread a more pe through a more peaceful and diplomatic measures. We can actually create a stable uh, global environment. Thank you for my time. You bet. Uh, Benjamin Letter, let's move that along to you. Hey, uh, Hody, just for clarification, can you repeat the question from the top, please? You bet. As Commander-in-Chief, you will have an executive responsibility to lead our men and women in the armed forces. First, give me any qualifications you might have in leadership roles as it pertains to combat. And second, give the audience a brief overview of your plan as a leader for the military. Uh, <clears throat> well, personally, I've never served in the United States Armed Forces, uh, but I, I am the first uh, male member of my family not to do so in about 400 some odd years. Um, my, my dad was a, an Army officer. His father was a, an Air Force uh, lieutenant colonel, um, and, and that kind of goes on all the way before the American Revolution. Um, I ironically have in my possession about 1,750 military manuals, uh, some of which from other countries. Um, and I, I've been uh, an active participant in the, uh, 
in the militia community for quite some time. It's something I enjoy and I, I compare to the volunteer fire department. And I think that uh, that is a, the method that was intended by uh, the Second Amendment. We hear um, a lot of gun rights enthusiasts, uh, they've shortened it down to two, 2A two and Second Amendment, but it's more than just gun rights. It's it's the militia. It's the, the defense of our, our country. Um, there's a, an old army manual uh, on the subject of how to invade an, an urban terrain um, or an urban city. And it's called block by block. So if we were ever invaded, um, we would be invaded block by block eventually. And we would want to have that defense capability uh, in every home uh, on every block. And there, there's nothing more powerful than a firm respect for the Second Amendment and its full context uh, as for the defense of, of this country. Uh, as I, I said earlier, I think we've uh, <clears throat> stepped a little too far uh, into the, the Cold War tactics uh, of having bases and people uh, stationed all over the world. And, and I think that we can bring people home, but I think that we can augment that with modern uh, technology and not put lives at risk. Sure. Uh, let's get the closing answer to this question from Mr. Daniel Berman. So I guess uh, from my experience, um, as a leader, I don't have necessarily uh, military experience, although I have, um, I have met with a lot of the Texas militia. Um, I wouldn't really talk that up as a lot of experience. I don't know if a few hundred hours of Call of Duty counts. Um, so militarily, you know, with guns and everything, I can't say that I have that experience. What I can say I do have, and especially, you know, in this world that we're coming into where everything is really cybersecurity, we're talking about being attacked by China um, through, through cyber threats, Russian bots, all these other things. Um, that is a field that I work in extensively. Um, and I have managed teams and I have managed, um, you know, uh, uh, systems where we need to collect data and we need to find out how people are trying to abuse our systems and how to stop and prevent that. But also in, in this type of in this type of world, it's mostly defensive. Um, we don't talk, you know, in, in the military world, we talk about, oh, somebody's preparing to bomb us. Let's go blow them up. That's that's not necessarily how that works. Um, in, in information wars, it's more defensively. You don't need to attack the other person. You just need to keep yourself safe. Um, and realistically, you know, if you think about it, that, that works in, in, you know, big explosive war machines too. As long as you're keeping yourself safe, what does it matter? If, if somebody's launching missiles at you and you can shoot them all down, does it matter that you're not attacking the other person? Eventually, they're going to run out of, of resources and they're going to see that it's not doing anything. Now, something else that's, that's really interesting is the world that we're in now, because we have this global economy and because we're trading with everybody so much, it really doesn't, you know, like Arvin was saying earlier, if, if we start to open up trade between all these different countries, it actually hurts them to try to attack us. Why, why would China want to want to attack the United States when we're sending them all this money? We're buying all of their exports. Um, when we have trade like that, it doesn't benefit anyone to do that. So that's something we need to look at and de-escalate instead, uh, instead of retaliating. Okay, next question. Scholars are split on the concept of torture's effectiveness. While there are documented instances of preventing catastrophe through the means of torture, there are at least an equal number of instances in damage done to international relations resulting from such a practice. If you oppose torture, how would you defend your policy to an American populace that finds itself in danger due to the knowledge of a captive? If you support torture, how would you go about explaining the studies, including the, the one from the Scientific American that, records, that records how torture has managed to put more lives in danger and not less? And we'll go ahead and start with Christopher Marks. From what I've read, torture is ineffective. The only thing that is, is it, that it is effective at getting is bad information. If you torture somebody long enough, they will agree to anything that you say to get, want them to say just to get them you to stop torturing them. It's a ridiculous practice. Um, you know, the same practice goes uh, when we go when we look at Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay, they they tried to. One, the United two, 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 States uses it as a legal loophole. 
That is one of those things that will be immediately shut down. Not an open-ended promise like you got from the Obama administration. It will be closed and it will be defunded. Um, so yeah, no, I would just sh I would just stop the practice. It's it's unethical. It's it's immoral, and quite frankly, it's ineffective. Okay, Daniel Berman, you're up next. Uh, sorry, can you re repeat that question? Yeah, you bet. Scholars are split on the concept of torture's effectiveness. While there are documented instances of preventing catastrophe through torture, there are at least an equal number of instances in damage done to international relations resulting from such a practice. If you oppose torture... How would you defend your policy to an American populace that finds itself in danger due to the knowledge of a captive? If you support torture, how would you go about explaining the studies, including that from the Scientific American, that records how torture has managed to put more lives in danger and not less? Right. So uh, I want to say I absolutely oppose torture. Um, it's, you know, our government at every every level uses some form of torture to to coerce things out of us um uh as as chris said it gets bad information um you'll you'll get people to admit to crimes which i mean you know we talk about we talk about torture and we, we think about terrorists being tortured so we can find out where the bomb is or something and we always see movies where like that's the case um you know and i see those as propaganda there was a there was a movie um where you know they did that they tortured somebody and they they tortured him by killing his son in front of him uh so that he would give up the location of a bomb these aren't realistic scenarios they don't know that they have the right person and this is in in most cases when we're talking about the military wanting to know the location of a bomb it's their bomb the fbi has created this bomb and given it to somebody they know where it is um We've, we've gotten nothing but bad information from torture, and we've caused a lot of harm to innocent people because of it. And this isn't just like at the big international level. You look at um, what, our, what our local governments do in coercing false testimonies out of people, convincing them to plead guilty to crimes they didn't commit so that they're sent to prison for, for decades. Um, and then we find out later, some people we've even exonerated um, after they're dead because we found out that they got some really bad plea deal out of, you know, essentially torture. It's non-physical torture. It's mental torture saying, hey, your punishment is going to be this if you don't just confess. Um, these are all forms of torture. It needs to stop at every level. There's no good use for it. I am an avid 24 fan, so I remember the episode you're talking about. Arvind Vora, you're up next. Uh, think for a moment where we are right now. We're having a presidential discussion to be the, the representatives of the Libertarian Party, to try to be the representatives of the United States, a country that's supposed to be a city upon a hill, a standard for other nations to look towards as the way to live, the way to act, the way to conduct ourselves. And we are discussing whether or not we should torture people. Well, let me answer the question first. No, no, absolutely not. We should not torture people ever. It is militarily ineffective. It is morally disgusting. If we're going to be the torturers, then we are the bad guys. And I don't want us to be the bad guys. I want to be on the, on the side of good. And that's the side of peace. It's on the side of nonviolence. It's on the side of righteousness. So, let me, so let's get that out of the way. No, absolutely not to, to torture. But where does this come from? When you give people a fool's errand and you give them the wrong tools to do it with, they will eventually keep accelerating, keep trying to build up, keep going further and further on an ineffective method. And that's what torture is. It's, it's showing that people are going down this path of total nonsense. It's a real living world, real life world version of the Stanford prison experiment. We need to have a culture war, not just inside of America, where we need to convince people to jury nullify and stop going to government schools, but we need a culture war, 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 culture war worldwide. If we want to defeat ISIS, which I do, we're not going to do it through violence because ISIS, frankly, it's based on splinter cells and based on radicalizing people who are already in another country. The only way to defeat an idea, a bad idea, is with a good idea. And the way we spread those good ideas is through open trade. It's through ending all restrictions on freedom of the press and freedom of speech. That's why I've pledged to, to pardon Assange. It's through using our greatest asset our ideas, our culture, American culture for all its shortcomings, it is the greatest culture on earth. 
And let's spread that culture instead of relying on violence to try to ineffectively change minds and ineffectively get information. Great. Kim Ruff, your thoughts on torture? (laughs) My thoughts are, Arvin, get out of my head. (laughs) Every (laughs) single note I wrote down before he even said it, I even wrote Stanley Milgram's prison experiment. As soon as he said it, I'm like, no! (laughs) But yes, absolutely, everything he said. And to extrapolate on that, to build on that foundation that he already laid is to recognize the fact that this isn't the inherent problem with our entire foreign policy approach, is that we dehumanize other people. We see seeing people in other nations as individuals. It's the same problem we run into in the immigration debate. We fail to recognize that there are other people who happen to live on a different landmass in different political boundaries who have different interests than ours, but they're still human beings. They have lives, they have families, they have desires and wants and needs of their own. And once we cease viewing people as indeed individuals, then we can do all sorts of terrible, horrible things to them. And that is precisely the situation we are in in this country. And that's the narrative that's fed to us by our government. It is constant rotating cast of characters, the scary other du jour, the boogeyman that we always need to be afraid of. And that has what kept the military industrial complex constantly raking in profits and constantly in conflict. We need to buck that by recognizing the inherent humanity in people and stop debating the efficacy of immoral behaviors and start showing, as Arvin very well pointed out, that we can indeed be the standard bearers of right, that we are that shining city on the hill that we've often spoken of and have failed to achieve. Great. I uh, I read The Lucifer Effect, one of my favorite books. Uh, uh, ben Letter, you get to close up on this issue. I still can't believe we're talking about torture too, but you know, you know what's more effective than torture? Sending a guy home with a, you know, a cup of coffee and a a cigarette and a copy of the Bill of Rights and telling him to ask whoever the hell he's working for, you know, are we getting this good of a deal? Most countries don't have the, something like the second amendment or many of the other uh, aspects and freedoms that, uh, that we uh, enjoy and that we uh, we fight for, and we sometimes convince people that that's the reason that we're fighting, and sometimes it's actually not. But I think it's more torturous to a tyrannical regime to uh, to send uh, somebody that they send to us uh, to hurt us or destroy us home uh, as an advocate of us. Uh, I once heard a story about a, a Nazi that was uh, held captive in some midwestern town or something. Uh, you know, as part of some kind of work program and remembered for the rest of his life uh, how much he enjoyed the time that he was in America, even though he was in a basically a labor camp. But he found enough about this place that he liked that all of it for the rest of his life. And I think that there's no more torture for a tyrannical regime than to have people in your own country telling telling people how great America is, like that uh, Iranian runner that uh, ran with the American flag recently. That was, that was pretty cool. That's That's torture. Great, guys. Well, uh, obviously, we had some mixed thoughts on that one. So let's find something that's a bit more <laughs> unifying. <laughs> Overseas military bases and spending, which is over 300, and, or I'm sorry, $630 billion annually, are both at record levels. The controversy regarding those bases has made its way into public discourse. Yet political scientists at various outlets note that these bases actually prevent civil war, the resulting trades have actually been a net boost to our economy, and it increases the response time uh, that prevents other nations from attacking other countries. In fact, with over 800 bases currently, complying with the international request to build more bases would mean we'd actually have to build another 800 bases. Would you comply with military and economic demand, both here and abroad, and expand America's influence, or would you scale this back? If so, what is your reasoning? And we will start with Ben Letter. Well, I I would scale it back because I think that we're using an old method. Um, You know, war is not really fought with tanks and these old bases anymore. We're seeing a lot more uh, drone strikes, uh, things of that nature. Um, We're seeing uh, more cyber warfare. Um, I think we should be investing less in these in these bases. I think that uh, the people in these countries uh, are, are perfectly capable of defending themselves, uh, assuming that they have the ability to do so. Uh, that they're not being denied access to the to the tools to, of defend, you know, to be able to defend themselves. Um, 
I don't see why we need to be in the, in the middle of all these fights, uh, especially in a, in a physical capacity. Uh, I don't think that really any libertarian does. I don't think there's a libertarian out there that uh, wants to build more military bases or thinks that that's somehow uh, beneficial. Now, if, if some defense contractors, uh, you know, if their bottom line gets hurt because of this, because they were banking on some type of world events to head towards that direction, well, I'm sorry for them. It's not in the interest of our country and it's not in the interest of the world. Great. Let's move it along to Arvind Vora. I want to talk about a particular failed state and show how things go, go with that. So this failed state, a short time after its creation, was in a bloody and brutal civil war. And it was one of the most horrific civil wars in human history up till that point and even since then. Now, that state was the United States of America. A hundred years into its founding, it was failed. And yet, they found their way past it. The United States, we found our way past that. And that was part of our developing into the superpower that we are today. It's not our business to manage every country's civil war. First, it's beyond expensive. It is essentially impossible. Instead, it is our job to let other countries develop as they see fit to develop through these things. Let them face the horrors of war. Let them understand what happens if you cling to theocratic backwardsness. Let us let them see what happens if you insist on totalitarianism or socialism or communism. Let them learn those lessons. Today, we're considering invading Venezuela. And I say let Venezuela and the rest of the world learn the lessons of socialism without us doing one single thing. We need to get shut down foreign military bases. We need to bring the troops home. And we need to start with this idea, which is that the United States military, if we have one at all, should only exist to defend the United States. Now, as a nuclear power, we don't feel, face a realistic threat from a foreign power, we, uh, from a traditional army. We face only threats from ideas. The way we fight ideas is through cultural war. And how do we fight a cultural war? Open trade, sharing our ideas through commerce instead of war, through spreading our ideas through peace instead of through violence. The idea that we should be defending everyone from everyone else, it's, it's absurd and it only enriches military contractors because it's essentially an infinite cost thing. It's something that could never be achieved. It's not a war that's meant to be won. It's a war that's meant to go on forever and ever. And I'm not gonna allow that to happen. If I'm elected, I'm shutting that down, shutting down all foreign military bases, bring the troops home. Okay, I'm sorry about the way the random list works, but Kim, you get to go after Arvin again. No, <laughs> I'm like ditto. I <laughs> yield. No, <laughs> no, um, no, ab absolutely. He's absolutely right. It's essential to the growth of society to periodically have regime changes to let that pot boil up and over. When did we suddenly decide that the United States of America was responsible for being the world's police? We take the resources of our people and their taxpayer dollars, and then we put them over in foreign countries to what, plug a hole in the dam to prevent it from overflowing? No, allow the natural ebb and flow of societies, the evolution of people. Have them sort out their own conflicts. That's the only way you truly grow. And maybe as Arvin pointed out, if you experience the bitterness of war, the huge extraordinary loss of life and property that comes with violent conflict, you will be a hell of a lot more inclined to engage in open communication and dialogue. And that's really what's sorely lacking. So yes, by all means, I don't buy that argument for one minute that we have a responsibility to do that, to build more bases, to be, we are currently in 150 different countries. We have 800 active bases. Most people who go in the military usually are planted in like Korea or Germany or Italy where we don't actually have active conflicts. Close them all, bring our troops home. Let's put all those great minds and individuals to work in the private sector and build our economy that way instead of enriching defense contractors and other interested parties by engaging in what is, as Smedley Butler pointed out, the racket of war. Daniel Berman, you're up next. So the question is, um, you know, to kind of go back to these these bases that we have. Um, so suppose they do some good. Should we be paying for it? Absolutely not. There, there are bad things that happen around the world in every place around the world all the time. And we don't need to be the world's policemen. But 
there are people who are being negatively affected by that and we shouldn't just turn our backs on them. But what does that mean? Does that mean we should create this massive military that runs around the world saving people? No. What we should do is we should encourage people through information, through volunteerism, to encourage people to protect themselves, to encourage people to learn about how governments and these regimes work, to understand that freedom is a better solution. We want people in foreign countries to, to adopt this idea that freedom is better for them, that they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't have their lives run by tyrants and, and especially violent tyrants who are forcing them to uh, interact with the government in ways that, that is not good for them. So we should, we should encourage that, but we shouldn't steal from Americans to set up a military power to violently go in and attack people that, you know, to change things. It doesn't work that way. Um, sure, there, there might be some good benefits from, from one thing, but do they outweigh the negative benefits? And is it a just way of doing it? There are more just ways to do this. And if we encourage people, like I said, to, to spread that information and, and get people to understand and lead by example, show, I mean, it's not like our country's in the best condition now where we have police shooting innocent unarmed people. Why don't we fix some of our own problems and lead by example so that other countries will say, hey, America is maybe the greatest place on earth. L look, at, look at how low their crime is. Look at how the government doesn't attack their people anymore. They solved all their problems. If we lead by example and fix our own problems, other countries will follow suit because ultimately the people always outnumber the dictators. Awesome. Christopher Marks, you get the closing comments on this one. I absolutely detest the idea of American exceptionalism. We have domestically problems with our state governments kidnapping children from parents, kidnapping parents, incarcerating them all to get social security funds to fund like here in Indiana, $1.2 billion in 2017 Department of Child Services. We have, um, and then you've got to calculate in that annually it's about 34,000 to actually take care of each inmate that's in the for-profit prison system. Um, we've got all of these problems here in the United States and we're, and you're telling me that there are 800 base, military bases across, uh, overseas that are costing us ha over half a trillion dollars or about half a trillion dollars when we're $22 trillion in debt. I always had a, I've always had a metaphor. If your relationship is in shambles, don't go to your neighbor and give them relationship advice because that's ridiculous. That's what we're doing here in the United States. That's what American exceptionalism is beating our chest to, and it needs to be put to a stop. America isn't the greatest nation out there. It isn't the greatest anything because we have our problems. And until we actually stop looking outward and take a look inwards and fix our nation from within and actually make America great for the first time, only then could we ever tout any level of American exceptionalism and offer relationship advice to a foreign government. All right. Great job, everybody, right at the two-minute marker on that one. All right, next question. Prisoners of war are largely protected by the Geneva Convention and other treaties established through the United Nations. However, it is well known that countries, including the United States, routinely ignore these arrangements. It's a two-part question I have for you. How would you treat prisoners here in the United States, and what would you do about, Amer uh, about American prisoners who are tortured and, and abused abroad? And we'll start that once again. With Ben Letter. Ben, if you're talking, you may be muted. Yeah, no, there he goes. Okay, uh, go ahead. We're speaking specifically of prisoners of war. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we have a tradition in the United States of a, of a fair trial. And if we have a, a prisoner, whether they're a prisoner for theft or robbery or some type of uh, war crime, uh, they, should, they should receive a, a trial uh, as anyone else uh, should. Um, and as far as uh, Americans that are, that are being held uh, 
prisoner uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, I don't think we've done uh, enough necessarily in every instance to negotiate for the release of some of these some of these folks. Um, you know, I don't know if there's necessarily a perfect solution in, in every case, but you know, I do believe in the uh, the idea of making uh, every every effort possible to uh, to get that person returned to the United States uh, in, in good physical condition. Um, those are those are always tough uh, situations, and, and they're case by case. So you know, I, I don't want to give any broader general generalizations of, of something that is, is so so grave of a situation, but I think uh, we should make every effort possible uh, to get our people back. All right, that goes to Daniel Berman. So uh, this is an interesting question. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, how do we treat prisoners in general? Um, we should treat them like human beings. Um, for when when we have, let's say we have a prisoner of war, it's likely um, that as so many of our military are, they join for the wrong reasons. They believe they're on the side of good. They're doing something good for their country. They're they're saving their own people. They're protecting lives. Um, whatever the case may be, everyone always believes they're on the side of good, even criminals. Um, and when we look at the way militaries work, usually the the soldiers believe they're on the side of good because they're convinced through propaganda through orders they're told hey you don't need to ask too many questions all you need to understand is that's the bad guy we're the good guy so people are trained this way and we we shouldn't say okay this person made a mistake and fell into a bad situation we now have them um captured as a prisoner um we we don't need to treat them as you know, uh, as less than human because of that. We need to understand that that's, that's how this happened. We also need to understand that when we put our military in places like that in foreign countries to invade those countries, we're basically doing the same thing to them. We're training them. We're giving them propaganda. We're, we're feeding them lies so that they believe they're the good guys so they can invade someone else's country who doesn't want them there, who doesn't, they're not helping. They're not doing anything good for anyone. And so if they're captured, um, you know, this, that's really kind of the same thing. Um, but we need to also understand, okay, are we going to try to save those people? Uh, first, we need to stop sending those people. And that's going to be a big part of it. We need to stop the wars that we're doing. We need to stop the lies that are creating these false wars. And that's going to stop creating all sorts of military casualties. Um, but if somebody is captured by, um, by a foreign country, we do need to see what we can do to get those people back. Um, because that's, that's really part of the deal, right? You're going to die for your country for, for whatever lies that, that the military has told you. And this, this kind of makes it a difficult question to answer because, you know, we're talking about people who are fighting overseas for some war that we would never send them over there for. How do we deal with that? So are we talking about cleaning up um, okay. prisoners from old wars or um, creating new ones? And I think the, the most important thing we can do is stop creating new, uh, new casualties of any form in war. Okay, Christopher Marks, you get you get a shot at this one. Well, first I'd like to address what I do about uh, current prisoners of war of American people that are actually being held by foreign powers. And I would simply go to their current leading administration and say, hey, this is the Marks 2020 administration. I'm sorry that they, we've had a bunch of assholes running our nation in the past, um, I'm not that kind of guy. Um, so we're not going to be doing a lot of the things that have been done in the past. We really like our prisoner, a, a, our American people back um, home safe. Um, that way we can start the healing of our nation and work on fixing our house. Um, as far as uh, for, as far as to what I would do with uh prisoners of a war. There will be very few of them because I'm not a warlike individual. Um, and it, when it came down to a situation like that, I'd ask them a very simple question. Why? Why are you doing this? What do you think that America's great offense has been against you? When it comes down to the reality, 
of what America has done against a great many of nations, peoples, is we have been bombing the Middle East for 30 plus years, trying to control their exchange of for uh, their exchange of petroleum. And I've put a stop to that. That is actually when we go back to our one of our fir- our other debates is the reason why I'm looking at trying to change our economy into a renewable resource electricity that we domestically produce. So there won't be as an incentive for the United States to go to war against foreign powers. We won't have other prisoners. And when it comes down to it, we owe a, the, a great many of people in the Middle East a big apology for what America has done to them. All right, let's move that along. Kim, you actually get to go before Arvin for once. Yes. So go, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I love this question because it's so loaded. It's one of those things where it's like, you're going to have prisoners of war. So are you going to give them bread and water? Or are you going to give them some nice digs? And <laughs> the, the problem is that we have policies that have created war, that have created prisoners of war. We shouldn't be asking how we should treat them. We should not be creating them in the first place. We shouldn't be engaging in conflict so that we do have a situation where people surrender. Anyone that's currently a prisoner of war, such as Guantanamo Bay, needs to be immediately released. No questions asked. We were wrong. We have suspended habeas corpus. We've mistreated them. We have created this monster that is our situation. We have trifled in the Middle East since the Cold War era in order to prevent the spread of communism and Soviet influence. And in so doing, we have kicked a hornet's nest. And that is blowback, just as Ron Paul said. All these people are frustrated for the same reason anyone would be frustrated. We are going into their country and telling them how it's going to be. It doesn't matter what their democratically elected processes are. It doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter what they believe or how they wish to live. We have interest in that area and we're going to force our way on them. So yeah, we made them mad. And then we perpetuate the problem by torturing them and by keeping them permanently interred. On top of that, the other question that I have a problem with is what we define as a prisoner of war. What we define as war is if you look at the situation with Japanese internment camps during World War II, all of those people were American citizens. And yet because we were scared of the Japanese and we did push that one too, with tariffs and by engaging in some hinky behavior in the Pacific, we ended up taking all these American citizens and Japanese immigrants and sticking them in internment camps. And we said that was perfectly acceptable because we were at war. Well, according to our own policies, we're always at war. And there's always somebody that we're fighting with. So it's never acceptable to make prisoners of war and it's never acceptable to be at war. And insofar as negotiating for other people, man, it's gonna be a busy first week in office. (laughs) I'm gonna have to go to so many countries and just basically say, listen, I'm not going to mess with you anymore. We are not those people anymore. We Thanks. cannot undo what we did, but we'll end the cycle of abuse now. Give us our boys. Let's go home. All right. Arvin, you get to follow up on that. Uh, it's okay for you to say ditto to what she said. Move on. <laughs> I actually want to address the the first part of my comments, if you don't mind, Hody, not to you, but to the families of people who do have uh, uh, sons and daughters who are prisoners of war. Your, your children were lied to by the U.S. government, uh, and we, as we all were. I mean, we were told, for example, that the Gulf of Tonkin event happened that got us in the Vietnam War, and it never happened. It was, it was a made-up and fictitious thing. And based on false information, your sons or your daughters have been sent overseas to commit atrocities. They, what they've, they've killed people without justification. They've damaged property. They've, they've maimed people. They've done all kinds of horrific things. And not surprisingly, those countries have arrested them and locked them up. Uh, And in in a lot of ways, they're kind of getting off easy because the normal punishment for multiple murders is much worse than what they're facing. Now, that said, I've been tricked by the same government. I know that this government can be tricky, so I'm not going to leave them there. But I do want you to understand this. What they were doing was wrong. They were tricked into doing something wrong, but it was wrong. Now, when it comes to negotiation, when it comes to tactical thinking, you'll find that there's not many people who have the same level of skill that I do. It is one of the things that I am the best at. And I will certainly put all those skills to use to try to get your sons and daughters back home. As to people who are here, who are our prisoners of war, the United States, we have a fundamental belief. We have a belief in, as as Kim just mentioned, habeas corpus. That means you have the right to a trial. 
you don't the idea that we simply kidnap somebody, put them in a, in a cage, and say you can't have a trial. That's morally wrong. That's un-American. It's unethical, and I'm not going to stand by that. If if you did something wrong in the United States under the current system, yeah, you need to stand trial. But you're going to stand trial. You're going to face a jury. You're going to face a judge. You're not going to be just locked up with no possibility of any kind of civil remedy. So I'm going to work to bring the prisoners of war home. I'm going to stop sending people overseas so we don't make any more. And the ones here, they're going to get a fair and reasonable trial. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Next question. Enemies of America attempt to get a hold of nuclear bombs and technology. On one hand, the effort to prevent the acquisition of nuclear bombs is expensive, forces countries to use inferior technology, and it's also very invasive. On the other hand, intelligence from multiple nations has noted that our efforts have prevented nuclear bombs from being acquired by Al Qaeda, ISIS, North Korea, and others. What would you do, if anything, about hostile forces attempting to get a hold of nuclear bombs and why? And luck of the draw, we'll pick up where we left off. Arvind Vori, you get to start with that. Let's think about why countries want nuclear bombs in the first place. You're dealing with something that's big, it's expensive, it has radiation risks. It is a problematic thing to have. And as much as I like weapons, I don't want a, I don't want a recreational nuke because it seems like a gigantic nuisance. But the simple fact is one of the few countries that the United States has not un, unjustifiably recently gone to war with is North Korea because they have nuclear weapons. Countries want nuclear weapons for one reason, which is to stop the United States from invading them. The United States invades countries just as much as it, it, it violates people's natural property rights at home. In order to get the United States military to stop, many countries believe correctly, they correctly believe that the only way to do that is with a nuclear bomb. My job is to make convince countries that they don't need that. You don't need a nuclear weapon to stop the United States of America. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to shut down all foreign military bases and bring the troops home. Create a reputation of no longer invading or violating other countries' sovereign territory. Now, the question is, would I, would I work to help other countries build a nuclear bomb? No, it's, it's, a, it's a disgusting weapon. I, it's, it's a weapon that kills more innocents than it does military targets. It's not a weapon that I support using. It's certainly not a weapon that I would want to see spread any further. And I certainly believe that that restricting access to that information through whatever uh, method, you know, whatever cryptography or whatever is totally fine. But the key here is we need to get rid of the demand for the nuclear weapons. If we keep that demand, which is created by invading other countries, countries are going to find some way or another to, to get that. They're going to figure out some way to do it. And yes, it'll probably be an inferior bomb. And yes, it's probably going to have more, more issues. Ending this kind of demand for nuclear weapons can only happen if we stop invading countries, if we stop acting as the world's police, if we stop getting involved, for example, on both sides of civil wars and other absurdities. So I'm going to shut that down by, by getting rid of that demand, by bringing the troops home, shutting down foreign military bases, and ending world policing. Okay, moving on. Benjamin Letter. <clears throat> well cat's been out of the bag on the on the nuclear weapons for uh, 70 years now a while um and uh, right now i think there's what nine nine countries that have nuclear weapons um now of course some 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 of those could be uh, pre-staged in other countries clandestinely um supposedly some have been stolen and have come up missing uh the soviet union used to just keep them under you know padlocks in siberia thinking nobody was going to go out there um they're out there um and for the most part uh, i think like everybody here has identified at some point this evening that uh you know people not governments but people um don't want to wage war. Um, aside from you know the the lone the lone madman. Now, if we had one of those Hollywood esque situations uh, where we somehow knew in advance that a lone madman was about to get a hold of a nuclear weapon, probably the right thing to do would make a, 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 a diligent effort to to prevent that from happening. Um, and I think that that counts as defense. Uh, in in that instance, um, 
but there is a there is a nuclear uh, market out there. Um, you know, we see a lot of news reports about Hillary Clinton being involved in uranium sales. We're talking about nuclear pro proliferation. That's uh, well, that's that's exactly what that is. Um, so Thank apparently, you. we're engaging in it on the highest levels, and I don't think we should be. All right, you're up, Kim Ruff. Okay. <clears throat> Something that we fail to do when we talk about foreign policy is that we have a tendency to not recognize that some of the concepts that we can apply on a microcosmic level, on a neighborhood or community-based level, aren't going to necessarily apply on the international stage. But they do. There are certain universal truths, such as libertarianism. That is a universal truth. So I'm going to give you an example of something that is totally unacceptable in order to prove a point. Consider The Walking Dead. Many people watched that show and we saw Negan, who was the bad guy of all time. He was terrible. He had a monopoly on force. He and his rotten crew of people went around and invaded other people who were trying to live peacefully. They harmed people enormously. And we as viewers watched that and we hated him. We wanted him to stop. We wanted our heroes to have the ability to fight back against this horror. And yet, if you extrapolate that, if you look at it on a macrocosmic level or apply this narrative to how we are on the international level, America is effectively the Negan of the walking dead of the world. We are the ones who have a monopoly on force. From any other standpoint, from any other country, they cannot compete with us on the same level. We are entrenched in 150 different countries. We are everywhere. We have one of the biggest, strongest, most well-funded militaries in the world. And we're up in everybody's business. People talk about China and its extraordinary human rights violations. The biggest human rights violation that China does is to bankroll our military. We are the bad guys here. So we have to stop this. We have to stop being these people. We need to recognize that we don't have a duty to fight the world's conflicts, to be the world's police. And we need to bring all of our people home and stop perpetuating this problem. Awesome. Uh, next up, we have Christopher Marks. I think that America kind of forgot that there's only one nation ever who has used a nuclear weapon during a time of war to injure a foreign enemy. And that was America. And then we turned around after we saw the horrible effects of the first one and I think it was like three days later, we said, oh, we have a different version. We'll try that one too. And we made a, another horrible, immoral action against innocent people. I don't think America is fit to speak on what kind of foreign powers should have nuclear weapons because quite frankly i think that the reason why a great many of foreign powers want nuclear weapons is as a nuclear deterrent to united the united states threat of nuclear force so i think that america needs to actually man up and denuclearize themselves voluntarily because let's just face it if somebody wants to invade your nation the last thing that they want to do is drop a nuclear warhead on your na on your land your territory and all of the assets that that th that that land comes with and make it a fallout area for what 30 years or so we don't need it, and we should stop. Okay. Uh, and then closing statements from Daniel Berman. So I, I think um, Chris made some really good points there. Uh, there is only one country who's used these before. And, you know, we talk a lot about the Second Amendment, and we need, we need weapons. We, we'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And this is ultimately what it comes down to with, with some of these other countries. It's, it's a defense weapon. It's, 
it's um, it's it's to hold your position to say, you know, hey, don't invade me because something bad might happen. It's not a really useful offensive weapon. Um, like Chris pointed out, you're not going to drop a nuke on somebody um, and then go invade so that you can take their resources, which you've now just destroyed. Um, with most, even even the United States, now that we have the technology, when we're when we're bombing people, and not that I agree with the the fact that we're still doing that, we're using we're using drones which are extremely targeted, which still hit the wrong targets because of bad information and all kinds of other reasons. But they're they're focused on specific targets because they know, you know, just wiping out the entire country isn't an effective strategy for anything. Now, at the same time, we have to realize this is. This is just, uh, you know, it's information. The information is out there. If the entire world destroyed all of their bombs the same way as the entire world destroyed all of their guns, people, it, it's just knowledge now. Other people would come along and say, hey, well, we know how to do it. We can just create more of them. You, it's, it's an idea at this point, and you can't stop an idea. You can't make it go away, and you can't put the cat back in the bag. So what I think we need to do is just kind of understand that and stop being afraid that everybody's going to nuke us and stop pissing everybody off to make them want to nuke us. Don't give them that incentive. Guys, thank you so much for your comments on that. We've got two more questions coming up. I do want to let everybody know who's watching. We will be uh, answering some questions. We've got a lot of interaction on the Facebook feed right now. We only have one question as of right now, and the candidates are going to do an open forum with your questions here in just a few minutes. So if you did have something that you wanted uh, answered and you haven't heard it answered yet, go ahead and link it in there, and we'll, and we'll have the candidates uh, kick it back and forth. All right, next question. Terrorists have ushered in a new age in the attitude of people regarding warfare. Before, a Cold War-style standoff could be achieved with a competing government, as these governments have incentives to stay alive and not blow each other up. In the modern age, America finds itself frequently fighting with terrorists who actually have an incentive to lose their own lives and the lives of their families while assaulting the United States. How would you fulfill your duty to protect Americans from enemies, foreign and domestic, when it comes to, to the area of terrorism and we will start with christopher marx okay can you repeat the first part of that question i'm sorry you're okay uh terrorists have ushered in a new age in the attitude of people regarding warfare before a cold war style standoff could be achieved with a competing government as these governments have incentives to stay alive and not blow each other up in the modern age, America finds itself frequently fighting with terrorists who actually have an incentive to lose their own lives and the lives of their families while assaulting the United States. How would you fulfill your duty to protect Americans from foreign and domestic uh, when it regards to terrorism? Oh, that one's easy. We just stop being the oppressive tyrants of the world. Um, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, I mean, I, I, I ask this question to a great many people every time I hear this Muslim, I, I get involved in like a anti-Muslim debate. Why do Muslim, uh, why do people from the Middle East have a distinct disdain for America? Well, it's pretty simple. For 30 plus years, we have bombed their family, their friends, their fellow villagers, and then the ones that survived dis detest us for the actions of our tyrannical government and they blame us the american people because we're supposed to be reigning in our tyrannical government and we seem to have been ineffective at doing so so from the position of the commander-in-chief i will rein in our tyrannical government and ensure that both the american people's rights are respected and turn our look more internal at our nation and healing our people, as well as making a great amount of many apologies to foreign, to foreign powers for what our government, our tyrannical government of the past has done to them and reassure them that, hey, America actually does have a moral compass and we don't real all think that way. Awesome. Let's get the thoughts from Daniel Berman on this. Sorry, can you uh, repeat that question one more time? Sure. 
Terrorists have ushered in a new age in the attitude of people regarding warfare. Before, a Cold War-style standoff could be achieved with a competing government, as these governments have incentives to stay alive and not blow each other up. In the modern age, America finds itself frequently fighting with, ter with terrorists who actually have an incentive to lose their own lives and the lives of their families while assaulting the United States. How would you fulfill your duty to Americans to protect them from foreign domestic threats in regards to terrorism? So I think... Uh, first, we can all agree less terrorists are better than more terrorists. Every time the U.S. goes and tries to get involved and supposedly kill some terrorists, all we do is create more. If we stop doing that, we get less or at least stay at the same number. That would be a good start. Um, creating, stop creating more terrorists so that it's not a problem. Now, we, al we also have to look at, you know, why are terrorists mad at the United States? They're not mad at me. I haven't done anything to them. They're mad at the United States government. This is, they've, they've done criminal things. And even if, even if we don't look at, you know, okay, let's say, let's say we allow the excuse of we were just following orders. Who gave those orders? Are there war crimes being committed here? War crimes that led to people dying which then led to terrorists being created. Would, would we be able to take down the number of terrorists by showing them, hey, we understand what was done to you is wrong, and we have, we have recognized that we have war criminals here in the United States that made those things happen, and we prosecute those people. And we show them, hey, look, this is the justice that you wanted. Because realistically, how, what other way are we going to get rid of terrorists? You can't kill them because you're only creating more. And it might be, depending on who it is, it might be immoral to do so. Um, this is the only way. We have to de-escalate things. We, we can't continue to escalate things. If we want to solve the problem, we have to de-escalate. That's the only way out. Okay, let's move this question over to Kim Ruff. Okay. <clears throat> I want to start this off by saying that terrorism, while it's a relatively new-ish concept post 9-11, the act of terrorism is not necessarily new. We had guerrilla warfare prior to that. We had the Japanese kamikaze pilots. Anybody hell-bent on achieving something is willing to die for it. So that has existed since time immemorial. So I just want to clarify that. The other thing that I want to say is that with respect to, yes, of course, on our broad foreign policy, absolutely, we're not going to engage in practices that are going to perpetuate the problem. But undeniably, people are not necessarily going to be mollified by a big public apology for all of our crappy foreign policy approaches throughout history. So what we need to do is encourage people on a local level to communicate and have community-based relationships. Right now, we are connected because of the internet, and yet we're so wholly divorced from our neighbors. We don't have healthy relationships at a local level. If we actually communicated with our neighbors, got to know the people that lived near us, built relationships with them, and then looked out for one another, defended each other, much in the way that Switzerland does, where they don't actually have an army, they have militias, individuals who know how to use firearms and look out for one another, Never you mind the fact that they're in a strategically nicely placed location. <laughs> if everybody actually had those relationships and they did look out for each other, then they could be the eye that catches the crime. They could be the people who defend each other rather than relying on government to be the eye or government to be the force because that never solves the problem. So that's how we would handle it there. All right. Uh, Benjamin Letter, you're up next. <clears throat> yeah, as Kim said, terrorism or the concept thereof is, is not new and it's, it's really kind of the antithesis of uh, libertarianism. Um, we, have, we have our uh, libertarian pledge, which basically says that we won't commit violence for political and social goals. And that's essentially what a terrorist is, is someone that's willing to commit violence uh, to achieve their political and, and social or perhaps religious goals. I think that there's an assumption that uh, the one thing creates a terrorist. Well, first off, what, what is a terrorist? I think we kind of defined if we look at it within the scope of, of that definition, but what, what creates that? Um, I don't know if every 
anybody that would fit into that category would have necessarily been created because of something uh, the American government uh, did to them per se. Uh, I'm certain that there is a percentage that do fit into that category, but I, I think it's safe to assume that, you know, it would be an overgeneralization to assume that they all fit into that same category. So I think um, if they fit into the category of where we have agitated this situation, de-escalation is, is the solution that's your first go-to. Um, if it's a, if it's some other strange category where, you know, for some reason that they just want to, you know, destroy us, I guess maybe that's a different, um, problem altogether, but, you know, I'm not necessarily aware of uh, a large group of anybody that's, uh, publicly declared that their aim is to uh, destroy America. I've seen some, some lone people, uh, proclaim that, uh, but, you know, not in a serious or credible capacity, but uh, I'm a firm believer okay. in the Second Amendment uh, as the ultimate solution of communities being able to secure themselves from all threats, foreign and domestic. Okay, uh, and then we will bring it home with Arvind Vora. I agree with the sentiments that I've heard that if we shut down our foreign enemy creation operations, we're probably going to create fewer enemies where if we stop antagonizing people, bombing hospitals and wedding, fewer people will want to blow themselves up in their effort to, to strike back the United States. If we stop harming people's families, yes, there'll be fewer terrorists. But it's, there is another step to that. And, and this is the important part. What fuels terrorism, what, the reason that somebody joins a terrorist organization is parallel to the reason that somebody joins any criminal gang. Low, they have poverty, they don't feel they have uh, opportunities, you have a charismatic leader that tells them a bunch of stuff they want to hear. And ending military involvement will reduce that to some extent, but it's not going to erase that. And so if we want to erase that, we need to take it one step further. Listen, we've all, you know, if, you, if you've ever talked to any group of white nationalists, they're going to tell you all kinds of things that the Jews do that range from unlikely to ludicrous. And those ideas with no evidence of any kind and tons of evidence to the contrary can still spread. And that could still happen in these areas. People could still spread that against America. So how do we address that? By spreading American culture. And the way we spread American culture is through free trade, it's through open borders, it's through making sure that our ideas are getting out there. When we let people in Iran and North Korea sell to America, for example, you know what happens? If they wanna advertise their goods to America, they have to learn about American culture. And that means they learn about American culture. They're advertised, their staff, their support groups learn about American culture. And they start to realize that these things that their government and these local terrorist groups are saying are simply not true. And they realize the power of freedom of speech, freedom of thought, liberalism, equal rights, these great things, and those spread with open trade. So yes, obviously I wanna shut, stop all these, this, this ridiculous military behavior, but I want to also use free and open trade, spread American culture to create the bonds of commerce so that we create allies instead of enemies. Gotcha. See here, I thought spreading culture through the mil military was awesome, but then you said it's bab <laughs> baboon level stupid. So I've kind of backed off on that. Uh, our final question here, guys, before we get to uh, some comments from the Facebook as well as the open forum. Victims of U.S. policy frequently apply to come to the United States from nations that are in turmoil. While most of these are collateral damage, we have had known enemies of the United States apply for asylum before. What would be your screening policy regarding these individuals that are fleeing from these hostile or nations that are in uh, disruption? And we'll start with Kim Ruff. Okay. I know a lot of people have been exploring the idea of reinstituting an Ellis Island style immigration policy. I'm personally a big proponent of sponsorship. This was something that was done by my surrogate grandmother. This is a family friend who was functionally like a grandmother to me. She was in Germany prior to the outset of the rise of Hitler. And her father, who was a doctor, got sponsorship from some patients of his who had moved to Michigan. So they sponsored the entire family to come to America. They found them a job. They found him some housing. They looked out for them in the community. I thought that was a really excellent plan because that was something that was strictly voluntary. It were people that were already in the community vouching for and speaking to other individuals and creating an opportunity for them and taking responsibility for their success. I think if we actually had much more of that kind of 
wonderful relationship with other individuals, if we, again, saw them as individuals and we treated them with humanity, we would be much more inclined to welcome them into our country. And I do think there's a lot of people who want to bring people who are seeking asylum from countries into this world and to sponsor them. And we should allow them to do so. So I think that's absolutely something we should do. And I think it's incredibly cruel that we have our military go into other countries and utilize individuals in those countries to aid the military, to be a translator, to provide them with resources at risk to their own life and security, and then tell them they can't come here. We owe it to people to allow them the opportunity to freely migrate to America should they so choose. And we can stop creating problems in their country though by stop meddling in their affairs as well. Ben Letter, you're up next. Well, I, I, I'm also a fan of the, uh, the kind of the reinstitution of the Ellis Island uh, that Larry Sharp's been tossing around a lot lately. Um, now, the way I interpreted the question was that you, you, you were talking about a, a form, former enemies uh, migrating here. Is that correct? That, that some of our asylums have been uh, enemies of the U.S., yes. As as in like, uh, that's such a broad term. Um, you know, I mean, if we're talking people who are from a country that has, maybe that country's been hostile to the U S specifically, I can give you a few specific examples. When I was doing the research for there, there are people that have attacked our embassies before, uh, who applied, uh, who are trying to basically work from the inside over here and they applied through, uh, for asylum. And then, uh, some people who actually staged an execution of an American hostage. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about letting those guys in, man. Um, you know, um, <laughs> that doesn't sound too reasonable to me. Uh, but, uh, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a, group of people that uh, are from a country that may be hostile to the United States, but they don't share uh, their government's sentiments and they're trying to get away uh, from that. Uh, I, I would be open to that. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to Daniel Berman. So I, I, I like that uh, Ben kind of asked the question, you know, what type of enemy is this? And to, you know, to your examples where it's somebody who's actually committed a crime against an embassy, against an American, um, even though this is in a war zone, you know, let's, let's forget about war. Let's, because we can even look at war as an act of violence. Um, if somebody committed an act of violence and they want to come to the United States and say, Hey, uh, treat me like a human being. Let me into your country so I can live among you. Um, would we do that to anybody who attacked a U.S. embassy in the United States? Would we do that to somebody who executed somebody just walking down the street in the United States? No, we'd charge them as a criminal and put them in prison. So whatever, however we treat criminals here is the same way we should treat a person who wants to come to the United States. Um, I wouldn't say, hey, no, we're, we're not going to let you in because then what are we doing? We're saying, OK, go back to your country and you're free to walk around and attack our embassy. Um, you're, you're free to do your crimes and, and, you know, the same as you were before. That's not really solving any problems by doing that, by accepting them and letting them in and giving them amnesty. That's not really doing it either. But if you say, well, hey, let's let's treat this person as a criminal, as any other criminal and put them through that same system then I think that might actually have the biggest uh, positive impact that, uh, of all of those options. All right, guys, uh, open forum time. First things first, is my mic oh, muffled? Howdy, do I get to respond to that one? Uh, no, Arvin, you don't, no. Uh, <laughs> actually, didn't I miss you? Did I miss, did I miss you and Chris? I think you did. Yeah, I, did. Yeah, I think you missed a couple of I, us. I'm just, I'm, I'm out of order tonight, guys. My apologies. <laughs> I'm sorry, Arvin, you're up next. <laughs> In, in 2016, at the Libertarian National Convention, there was a camera guy. Uh, he got to hear Nick Sarwark speak quite a few times. He got to hear me speak a couple times. And Kimby got to hear your speech, your nomination speech for Daryl Perry. And by the end of all of that, he had been converted. He became a libertarian. He, for the first time in his life, he never considered it, but he was, he was converted. 
the when you see people who are treating each other's w other with respect, when you see a, a group of people that really embody the ethics and morality that are universally understood, people get converted. When we talk about people coming to the United States of America, some are going to come here with hostile intentions, no matter how tightly we monitor them. You had the Las Vegas shooter. That's somebody who grew up in America, who was questioned by the police not that long before and still managed to evade it. On the other hand, you have people who grew up in America. They get these ideas from ISIS. They become radicalized and they didn't cross any border. And then they commit these horrible crimes. This is a war of ideas. Now, in terms of immigration, what should we do? Open borders, no welfare. I think I've made that clear many, many times, and I'll say it again. Open borders, no welfare. That's my position on immigration. But if we can work, if we can, as a, as a nation, really embody this idea that say, we want to do the right thing. We want to be better. We, yeah, maybe we don't want welfare, but we do want to be charitable. We want to be kind. We want to support, we want to support businesses. We want to get rid of the regulations that pre prevent human flourishing. We want to stop locking people up for no good reason. We don't want the largest prison population in the world. We should have the smallest prison population in the world. When people come to America, I want them to come here, even if, they're, if they have every plan to do harm, I want them to go native. I want them to say, yeah, here's what I thought about America. But as an adult, as a person that can look around and figure things out, I realize I was lied to. These are not people that, that wish anybody harm. These are not people that I want to harm. And that comes from a cultural change, and it begins with ending militarism, shutting down foreign military bases, bringing the troops home, and ceasing to use threats and violence, and instead using freedom, peace, and trade. Okay, Arvin, my apologies for trying to skip you. Uh, Chris, my apologies <laughs> as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, like the scenario that you had brought up in regard to uh, someone assaulting a a assaulting or attacking killing anybody um affiliated with like one of our u.s em embassies those embassies are meant to be um kind of gateways of good faith to foreign powers and foreign peoples uh that that seems to be kind of a misguided thing and i wouldn't want those kinds of people to actually be allowed to come into the united states until they got their stuff together and let, I mean, if they were, if they were trying to flee because they were misguided in some fashion, maybe there would be some exceptions, but other than that, yeah, I mean, the libertarian party is supposed to be the party that it is out there speaking of open borders. Let's do that. Let's bring people in. Um, I like Kim's idea and the Ellis Island idea of sponsorship. Um, let people experience America. I'm, I, we've discussed in regard to the visas, let's not put a limit on work visas and allow people to come in here and explore capitalism that American can, can provide, but we don't need the rigorous securities checks and stuff along those lines that are currently in place. Um, it, quite frankly, seems a bit xenophobic. Gotcha. Okay. Now I believe we're done. Uh, candidates, we did have a, a, we did have at least one question here that we want to talk about. Uh, again, this is open forum. Y'all can talk. We got to let's give it about 10 to 12 minutes for us to just have fun and banter back and forth. Uh, what should our relationship look like with Russia and Putin? I think that's, that's really a profound thing because there's so much fear mongering going on over there. Our relationship with Russian Putin to me should just be, if he has something to sell us, which I mean, Russia has oil, they have a lot of natural resources, we should buy him. If, and when I say we, I mean private companies inside America. And if private companies inside America want to sell to Russia, they should do that. And that should be the end of it. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that we still have that Cold War mentality that they're, you know, the big Soviet bear and that we need to hold them at bay. And while that makes a really good narrative, that's not actually realistic or true. So, yeah, absolutely. We should have free trade with them and develop a friendly relationship with them. They're not doing us dirty. We're doing them dirty in the way we talk about them. I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of Russians since 2015 with with translators um, 
and uh, there's really kind of a two. It's you know we've talked about it here tonight. Is uh, there's the Russian government, and then there's the Russian people, and the Russian people like to uh, you know, um, you know they like fashion. They like uh, you know going outdoors. Uh, they like dogs. Uh, <laughs> like good food. They like cooking shows. Um, and and they don't want they don't want any of this war business any more than you know any of the average Americans do. Then there's and there's the Russian government kind of like there's the American government. There's a, there's a little attitude shift there, or a differentiation between the, the, those two groups. You know, now I mean, Putin's not to be underestimated. He he grew up essentially grew up in the KGB. He's a, he's a mastermind of, of the intelligence world and should never be underestimated. And, and Russia uh, and elements within Russia do have. Uh, aspirations of, of expansion and they have they've done some covert invasions here themselves uh, over the last few years and uh, we hardly never never talk about uh, the, the little countries and little territories that they've been uh, invading and uh, the, the fact that they have their own version of black water uh, and many other things uh, we, we do not have a monopoly on, on this type of activity you said that you have a lot of Russian friends. I think if you're on Facebook, I believe half of the of your friends are Russian, just by 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 default of being on on Facebook. And uh, you did you did summarize their activities. You completely forgot to mention shirtless horseback riding, though. That's a that's popular. Actually, I'm I'm kind of interested in maybe possibly going to Russia at some point in time. Uh, over in Russia, they have a whole community that goes out and lives as indigenous Native American peoples. Um, they really? dress. It's like a cosplay lifestyle kind of thing they do over there. It's kind of interesting. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the posturing of Putin in regard to this I am a manly man kind of thing Uh I mean, quite frankly, any time if you understand anything about alpha posturing, when somebody feels compelled to actually exhibit some alpha posturing, it's generally due to some form of inadequacies. <laughs> Ooh. I, okay. Okay. So, so Chris is getting, Chris is taking us to war with Russia. Yeah. So that's that's all I heard. <laughs> will you say wanna... that to his? Will you say that to his face? Um, I'm actually a big proponent for if there is any type of uh, military action. Um, Native American culture. We actually had a war, ch a commander in chief, a war chief, and then we had a political chief. These were two separate individuals. And we would try to go through our regular chief for diplomatic measures, and then we would revert power in times of war to our war chief. I, as hoping to aspire to become the chief and war chief of the United States, uh, I am more than willing to, as a diplomatic measure, go into a pay-per-view event ringside knuckle up battle with any other president any other president <laughs> that includes Putin into an octagon ring paper event nation's winner the winner of that event the nation takes the pot for the pay-per-view event and I will knuckle up with any other pro leading a leading candidate man woman or child um, in the octagon to diplomatically resolve things if we need to actually fight it out this reminds oh, me oh my gosh of the movie idiocracy where we had the wrestler as the president <laughs> that's how that's how we got there uh, that's how we get there yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know what but if it saves our men and men and women in the military from actually having to go out and fight in some frivolous little tuffle because of somebody's opinion about somebody walking around riding a horse without their shirt on and alpha posturing so be it well i think that was that's kind of the idea of the olympics or the world cup or something like that is to have some some sort of international competition to you know show your show your supremacy of kicking the ball around or or something like that um but it's you know it 
of course, sports turns into something that, that totally becomes a distraction from people from what's going on in the real world. So while we're all watching, um, you know, hey, let's all come together as the world under the Olympics, the military's going, you know, hey, nobody's looking. Let's go do all our shady stuff now. And people uh, riot over soccer games, too. Yeah, that's it doesn't always bring out the best in people. The Miami is one of our, uh, during our diplomatic measures, we had this kind of practice called counting coup. And effectively for anybody that doesn't understand Native American culture, it's like a diplomatic panty raid where we would send one of our warriors in to steal something of some significance of the other um, tribe's possession. And then during the get together the diplomatic meeting where where our chief met with their chief we would go your drum see that i got your drum one of our warriors went through all of your other all of your defenses and we stole your drum here you go that there it is that's it back um do you want to go against our all of our nation's warriors um and it was a way of deterring people from or other tribes from warring against our tribes. Uh, it led to the Ir Il Iroquois Illinois Confederacy, um, where we had many tribal nations join together in a diplomatic union together, um, very similar to the way that the United States has unified its individual state uh, state jurisdictions. Anybody that thinks our craziest candidate is the one wearing a yellow hat isn't listening to the debates. Uh, Chris is downgraded from a little off to straight unhinged. Uh, you know, it's funny, for a brief moment, I was like, that's it, I'm out. Like, I can't compete with that. And then I thought, no, no, this cat's going to be my secretary of state. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait until you show up with Putin's panties. Uh, anyway, uh, guys, uh, guys, you got about... No. No, his shirt. I'm going to steal his shirt. You know that. He doesn't thing's want his dark. shirt. He never wears it. Anyway, you guys, have, you guys have three to four <laughs> minutes. If you want to talk about something else, go ahead. Whatever you want to talk about. I actually wanted to piggyback off of what Ben was saying, because it's something that we need to make abundantly clear as libertarians. Not only do we find our own government to be the biggest perpetuator of domestic terrorism, we also are inherently suspicious and justifiably so of all other foreign governments. Because just by the mere fact that they are individuals who chose to seek a monopoly of force and they end up forcing legislation down onto the people, deny them their inherent individuality, that is something to be suspicious of. So when you talk to us about Putin and how we were going to deal with him, very carefully, like Caesar's wife, for certain. But as far as the Russian people, there's no reason why we shouldn't engage with them in free trade. I think one of the things that's very true is if, is if our leaders act in a way that's so positive and so beneficial to our people that we don't bluster and create wars and conflicts and all that kind of nonsense. What that does is actually puts pressure on other world leaders to do the same. If, you know, it's kind of like with little kids are like, well, you know, this person's dad lets them do this. If, if we can be that same way, if we can be the leaders that, that are helping our people, that we're not in the way, we're not creating enemies, then the Russian people will say, well, well, why Putin? Do you have to engage in all these problems? America's not doing it anymore. They're better off for it. They've dismantled their military war machine. Why can't we do the same? We want wealth and prosperity and peace and trade too. It's not fair. You need to be more like the American leaders. And I think that's the kind of, of, of political pressure that actually works. Leading by example, it is the most effective way, in my opinion, to change somebody else's behavior. You know, I agree. I oh, think that we need to actually set an example because if we keep setting the bad example that we have set in the past, we're going to continue seeing bad examples surfacing throughout the uh, throughout the world. And when we actually take the moral high ground, we when we step up to the plate and we say, no longer, we're not going to do this. Like I said earlier, we need to man up and actually denu uh, denuclearize ourselves as a nation voluntarily. Not because anybody asked us to do it, just because it's the morally right thing to do. Um, I think that we'll start seeing other nations all across the all across the world going, 
we have to follow suit. We cannot let this kind of activity continue further on. I got to, I, I chuckle every time someone says nuclear, it's nuclear. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, to the, to this point of leading by example, it is a really great thing, but we have to understand that there's, there are two, um, two real uh, reasons why people are driven to do something. One is to create and produce and, and grow and move forward. And another one is to, is to prevent destruction or, or prevent harm to themselves. So when we look at, you know, the type of leadership we're talking about, we're talking about inspiring people to, to live their own lives and be productive and, 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 you know, live happy lives. And at the same time, there are people who want to control other people for profit and they're running around saying, Hey, while you're out there living your life, your house is on fire. You better go put your house out. And that's how they're using this, this fear tactic to gain political power. And these are the people who we usually end up voting for to lead. So we really need to address that as a huge problem because as much as we say, hey, we're going to teach you all how to be prosperous and we're going to lead you into prosperity, they're not going to have the attention or focus on that if, you know, the, if, if Trump and, and um, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are all over there saying, hey, your house is going to burn down. We got to stop the terrorists and all these other things. So I, I think it's a really important point that we need to address. You know, it's funny, just on a, on a microcosmic level, even in our own political campaigns, and I have seen none of you guys attack me. I haven't attacked you because what's the point? We're all working toward the same goal and we're trying to set a standard, bear a standard and show people that we don't have to sing to that level that people say politics goes to, that we don't have to engage in nasty tactics. Same thing applies across everything. If you want to make a better world, you yourself need to be a person of character, integrity, and manifest that in your interactions with others. It starts with you. Your president is just a person. They're a, stand, they're a figurehead and they control a few things, but they are still just a person. They're not a king. They're not a god. Don't invest all of your faith and trust in them to do for you what you should be doing for yourself. You have every right to be that person to empower yourself. Set your own standard and then spread it out into your family, your neighborhood, your community. That's how we're going to achieve this. That's how we're going to be better as people. All right, guys, we're uh, we're in for some clothes. We're due for some closing statements. So let's do this thing. Uh, and we will start with Christopher Marks. Three minutes, buddy. Go ahead. Well, I don't think that we really need uh, three minutes um, to cover this, but overall, we I think that unilaterally through watching this debate, we can come to the understanding that America is a great deal, a great big part of America's problem, and that is the reason why we need to look more inwards and less outwards. We need to fix our own domestic relationships before we go meddling in giving relationship advice to our neighbors. We don't need to use force to make the world a better place. We need to use peace, diplomacy, and setting a good example. And, today, and as you see, and just as Kim Ruff just stated, we in the Libertarian Party, we don't fight against each other. I make jokes all the time about Arvin being a making, if I win, I'm going to make Arvin the head of the Department of Education just because it'd be fun to watch everybody squirm in that situation. <laughs> and we can, in fact, do that. We can set an example. We start inward. We then reach outward to our friends. And I am surrounded by some of the most amazing people that I think that I've ever met. Our host, Hody included. You're so sweet. All right. Well, that wraps up the debates because he won. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, ben Letter, you got three minutes. Uh, okay. Um, well, the biggest gap, you know, one of the biggest gaps in, in our national defense right now is the concept of the militia has become uh, demonized. In a lot of sense, uh, it has become uh, almost uh, synonymous with the, the word uh, terrorist. Um, you know, uh, you know, Kevin mentioned that we we don't 
we don't attack each other. We're not here to do that. And, and earlier, you know, uh, Daniel had, had made a, a comment re referencing the, uh, the Call of Duty. Um, and, you know, I don't know if he had a bad experience with uh, some people that, that said that they were part of the Texas militia or not, but uh, everybody, and I've come across people like that too, but it's because that, you know, I'll tell you this, uh, down in Hurricane Harvey, you know, I met this guy, you know, I don't need to say his name, but uh, he, he was a retired Marine colonel and uh, he was currently a, a foreign service officer um, that protected uh, foreign em embassies. And, and I got into a conversation with him and I said, you know what, man, if, if guys like you were, were leading the militia, um, they wouldn't be such a joke. They wouldn't be able to paint it uh, in the way that they do. And, and the reality is, uh, you know, the, the concept of that militia lives everywhere. It's in your volunteer fire departments. It's in uh, your, your volunteer uh, police. It's in uh, volunteers of all different kinds, ham radio operators. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to, to get involved in that. It's not a, about running around uh, in, in the woods with a gun. Uh, that's hardly something the militia has ever had to really do much of. Um, I suppose, you know, it could happen. And, and th those are the fun, that's the fun training, but that's, you know, usually end up dealing with a hurricane or, or some other type of natural disaster. So I definitely encourage people to get involved in that. Um, but yeah, I guess that's my, about my time. So support your local uh, libertarian candidates. Uh, please, please contribute and donate to them. Consider becoming a local libertarian candidate and running for office. Uh, if you want to find out more about my campaign or get involved, uh, my website's benletter.com. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. Promote libertarian media. Libertarian media needs to be taken just as seriously as uh, any other uh, form of media. And uh, check out uh, the rest of these candidates as well. Great. Uh, Daniel Berman, your turn. There. Um, yeah, so uh, let me let me start out with the websites because I know I'm going to forget those. Uh, Berman2020.com, also legalizedpineapplepizza.org. I'm, uh, I'm running a contest right now over there to give away a year's worth of pineapple pizza along with some other cool prizes. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's ironic we're talking about um, looking inward to solve some of the problems. Um, and in my campaign, I'm actually doing a lot of looking outward uh, because there's I understand we like there is this thing like we're, we're having these debates and we agree on so many things um, really where I'm focusing a lot of my energy on this campaign is outward to Democrats and to Republicans um, to non libertarians because the reality is whoever gets the nomination in this libertarian party most libertarians are going to support that candidate anyway. Um, unless of course it's, uh, well, I, I won't say his name. He's not on this debate, but apparently there's a lot of opposition to him. Um, but realistically what we need to do is we need to put that energy. My belief is to put that energy into reaching people who are not libertarians, because those are the people who we need to get them to open their mind up to some of these things that we're talking about. Um, and so this is why a lot of my, if you don't see a whole lot of me in the libertarian circles, even though I'm all over social media, so you probably can't ignore me. Um, I am reaching out a lot outside of the libertarian party and I have a lot of volunteers and support who, who came from the Democrat and the Republican party. Um, I think that's really, really important. And you know, when Arvin talks about spreading American ideas to other, um, to other countries by simply trading with them, that's realistically what we're doing here. We're, we're, I'm acknowledging that the other parties exist, that they have people with different ideologies and saying, hey, let's sit down and have a civil conversation. Let's not fight over whose leader is better and whose colors are better and all these other things. So I think that's a really important point. And uh, so Berman2020.com and, and follow me on all this, all your favorite social media channels. Great. Well, we uh, Andrew Yang offers $1,000 a month. You're offering pineapple pizza for a full year. Kim, that's a tough act to follow, but it is your turn. You got to stop doing this to me. Put me after the lead. I, I can't know. handle it. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. I got bad news bears for you guys. I wrote a speech and as Arvin can attest, I don't know how to keep time. So this one might run over. I'm going to try and do my best and I'll do it fast. You ready? Let's roll. Go. It is fitting that we are libertarians chose to hold this debate on foreign policy the Thursday preceding Memorial Day. After all, our government's foreign policy is inextricably linked to war. Consider our own. 
Our entire Cold War policy was built on the international relations theory of realism that argues that anarchy is the permissive cause of war. In the aftermath of World War II, we divided the world into three segments. First world, which was U.S. and other democratic nations. Second world, the USSR and other communist nations. And third world, all other nations to presume to be neither and open to influence. And then spent the next 45 years engaging in what we downplayed as military or police action to try and prevent these third world countries from falling under the influence of the Soviet Union. We told our people it was to prevent communism, that communism was a disease and the only way to cure the host was to snuff it out. But that was what we just told people. The truth is much harder to bear. The truth is that we wanted international supremacy, that we saw these third world nations as untapped resources and we wanted access. Your nation sits on a huge oil reserve. Let us protect it for you. You have a government that is hostile to our presence. Let us overthrow it for you. Our government didn't care one whit about making the world safe for democracy or building an international community. If they actually did, they'd quit kicking the hornet's nest by invading other nations, stop providing armaments, material, and financial aid to foreign nations, and focus exclusively on diplomatic relationships and economic free trade as a way of building healthy, honest relationships with the rest of the world. At this very moment, we have 800 overseas bases, Troops stationed in 150 different countries and seven active wars, including the war in Afghanistan, which has now eclipsed the Vietnam War as the longest continuous war. We have 100 times more movies about World War II, and that only lasted one sixth of the duration Afghanistan has. Wait, is it because the terrorists hate our freedoms, as George W. Bush said? No, it's because war is profitable and there's a lot of money to be made. Eisenhower was an army general and a president, and you know what he told us during his farewell address in 1961? He warned us against the military industrial complex. Nearly 30 years earlier, U.S. Marine Corps Major General Smedley Butler warned us that war is a racket. Today, the biggest beneficiaries of the war machine are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, BAE Systems, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics. On average, more than three quarters of their annual revenue comes from defense contracts. 57% of our entire U.S. budget is spent on national defense. Politicians claim to support our troops, but unless our troops all have desk jobs in the heartland and stocks in the companies I just mentioned, there's very little support to be had. In four days, we will be honoring every service member who has fallen in the line of duty, including some of our own family members and loved ones. Our president will probably wear an American flag pin and give a speech at Arlington National Cemetery about duty and sacrifice. He will be surrounded by the color guard from every branch. They will give a 21-gun salute. It will be heartbreaking. But you know what's even more heartbreaking than that? That just last week, this same president was rattling his saber and threatening to start another war in Iran. My name is Kim Ruff, and I am running for president of the Libertarian Party, and I support our troops. I will end all foreign wars of aggression, cease providing financial aid to foreign nations, remove our presence from foreign nations, and foster healthy relationships on the international stage through diplomacy and free trade. You can learn more about me and our campaign at roughphillips2020.com. Time. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, And then that's it, right? No, I'm kidding, Arvin. No, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. Arvin Vore, your closing statements. I want to first talk about what I'm going to do if I'm elected. I'm going to shut down foreign military bases. I'm going to get the United States out of NATO. The simple fact is today, there is zero chance that that Germany is going to attack France. And so I'm going to get us out of NATO, let socialist Europe pay for its own defense, bring their troops home, and cut the military down to whatever is the minimum needed just to protect the United States of America. That might be nothing at all. But I want to take a moment to speak to those of you who are considering enlisting the young men and young women who are considering enlisting in the United States military. The military has lied to you. They've told you that being part of the military is a rite of passage or a trial by fire. In my new book, Pull Out, I negate that bizarre myth. The rite of passage between childhood and adulthood tells you what kind of adult you're going to be. And ask yourself this, do you want to be an adult that has no moral decision-making of your own? Do you want to be an adult who somebody else makes the decisions for you? Do you believe that adulthood is nothing but following orders, no matter how horrific, no matter how morally bereft, no matter how wrong? Is that what the kind of adult you want to be? I think we all know the answer, that none of us want to be that kind of supposed adult. If you want to be the person that you're meant to be, you need to choose what kind of person that is. 
And this is not just for people who want to enlist in the military. Kim Ruff pointed out those who work for companies like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. If you're an engineer, if you're a marketer, a computer programmer, you can do better than that. You can set a better standard than that. You can refuse to be part of the enemy. You can, be refu you can refuse to be part of the military welfare complex. The simple fact is this. If we refuse to be part of their machine, as so many GIs did back in Vietnam, when they were just some, simply stopped following immoral orders, if you can refuse, if we can refuse to be part of that, we can change American foreign policy. In my own business, every year we make the difficult decision to refuse all military contracts. And that means those contracts, each of those contracts would mean that I would make many times per year what I currently do. And I would rather make less money and be able to look myself in the mirror than become a millionaire overnight in the service of something that I despise. And that is a choice that each one of us can make. I wanna speak briefly about foreign aid. Foreign aid needs to go. It's unpopular and it's ineffective. And the simple fact is this, if you stop enlisting, if we all stop working for the military, if we stop funding these, these horrific dictatorships overseas through foreign aid, we can let the people of different countries make their own choices. And those are good people, just like most Americans are good people. I'm Arvind Vora. I'm running for president to end NATO, to leave NATO, to shut down foreign military bases, to use trade and not war, and to create an atmosphere of peace and prosperity. Learn more about me at votebora.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, candidates, for your time. I know that Wait. this is... Uh, oh. Did you, did you let Chris speak? You did, didn't you? Yeah. Okay, Chris, Chris, Chris started. <laughs> I'm being fair. I, 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 oh, that's right. I, I, I remember. I'm sorry. I've tried to cut him off before, but yeah, it's all good. Uh, candidates, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, Chris, uh, you had a birthday this week. Uh, happy birthday, buddy. Uh, and Perfect. yeah, and we're just, uh, we're so grateful for you guys for making the time to make this happen. I know there's a trail to hit, uh, and we appreciate you having this be part of your trail. These debates have been awesome. Audience, please share this around. Let us know what you think. Good, bad. All the candidates respond to everything is, is from what I've seen. Uh, so just, just share it around, get the word out there, let people know what's going on. And, uh, and that's everything. Thank you so much for tuning in. And candidates, we'll see you in a, another couple of weeks. We got another good debate around the corner. Uh, and we'll see you then. Until then, keep fueling the fires of liberty.